Um, last time we did the prime number theorem, right? So we proved the prime number theorem. I guess the, the form that I prefer is with the von Mangold function uh, because then it's just something nice and clean, x e to the minus some constant root log x. So far so good. Um, and the question became, right, so we're sort of going ahistorically, right? We started with Euler, moved to Riemann, moved to Hadamard de Villepoussin, and of course gave a modern treatment of that as well. So um, what I'd like to do is uh, go back to Euler, so back to Euler, back to Euler. And by the way, um, when he when he proves that the, uh, the product, that the sum of the reciprocals of the primes diverges, uh, now we can do it from the prime number theorem. We can see from the prime number theorem. So the prime number theorem, so this, okay, after a partial summation implies that the uh, sum of the primes up to x of one uh, is asymptotic. Let's do it the bad way, x over log x even though that's just the crude, how do I get rid of this thing? There we go, oh, there we go. Okay, so that's this crude approximation. And uh, so what this implies is that the nth prime number is asymptotic to n log n. So this again is more analytic uh, manipulations. And so what does that imply? Uh, well, if we want to sum over all the primes, if we sum over the nth prime, this is roughly summing over one over n log n. And summing one over, uh, sorry, one over, yeah, one over pn is like summing one over n log n, which we can compare to the integral, say, from two to infinity of dt over t log t. And this thing has an antiderivative. Do you know what it is? one over t log t. I'll give you a hint. It's a, uh, so you differentiate this one. So you get a one over log chain rule one over t. Mm -hmm. So this from, from two to infinity. So this diverges at the rate log log, which Euler already knew because this was, if you remember, this was log zeta log zeta, uh, I mean, of one, if we can be crude, but zeta goes to infinity like uh, log x. Zeta diverges, diverges at rate log x, right? It's the harmonic series diverging. So it's log diverges at the rate log log. Okay, so that, that's just the kind of reality check that uh, the prime number theorem is consistent with this. Now, in order to prove this, uh, he said, okay, therefore there are infinitely many primes, of course, tongue in cheek, infinitely many primes, which we already knew from Euclid. But uh, what I'm getting, what I'm working up to is Dirichlet. Now, a lot of people think, okay, so Dirichlet proves the whole primes and progressions, and that's it. Before Dirichlet, so before Dirichlet, Dirichlet, okay, well, let's, let's state Dirichlet's theorem. Dirichlet's theorem, this is 1837. And by the way, Euler is 1737. And maybe we'll get to Vinogradov, which is 1937. Before Dirichlet's theorem, so what is Dirichlet's theorem? Uh, for all A and Q co-prime, there exist infinitely many, there exist infinitely many, many primes congruent to A mod Q. In fact, so many, uh, the, the way that this is proved is that the, if you sum over the primes congruent to A mod Q of the reciprocal uh, of the of primes, then that diverges, okay? So that's, that's how he proves that. But before Dirichlet, there were lots of theorems of this form for special cases. Before Dirichlet, there were lots of special cases known. And these are kind of interesting to understand in their own right, I think. Uh, so just for one example, um, how about three mod four? You know how to prove there are infinitely many primes that are three mod four? Just with bare hands? What is it? Um, I don't know about all the primes, but that's a majority of 
So you can just do Euclid. You, the Euclidean argument works. Euclid works. How? Well, if uh, if P1 through PK is a finite list, finite list of uh, primes congruent to three mod four, then you form this number N, which is uh, four times P1 multiplied through PK minus one. This is gonna be a number that's congruent to three mod four. It's odd. So n is odd. And well, it can't be a product of only primes that are one mod four because products of things that are one mod four are one mod four. And uh, product over primes that are one mod four is itself one mod four. So there must be a there must be more primes that are three mod four. There exist more primes congruent to three mod four than the ones you had in your list. And that's true for any finite list. So there's infinite. Okay. How about um, this won't work. This exact idea won't work for primes one mod four. Because if you, you can multiply primes that are three mod four, and as long as there's an even number of them, that number will be one mod four. What do you do for one mod four? Lewis, you know this one? I'm trying to think, yeah. So what do you use instead of Euclid? Well, it's well, kind of Euclid anyway. Maybe you can use something in the Gaussian integers. Exactly, you can use Fermat. So Fermat, Fermat tells you that a number n is a sum of two squares, if and only if, when you prime factorize n, it's some powers of two, and then primes that are one mod four to any power you like, and then primes that are, uh, let's call them Q, that are three mod four to even powers, to FQ or whatever. Okay, so the only numbers that are representable as sums of two squares are ones which are have whatever factors of primes that are one mod four or two in them, but they have to have powers of primes that are three mod four uh, to even powers. Okay, so if, P1 through PK is a list, is a finite list of primes uh, congruent to one mod four. Let capital N be, um, we multiply them. Uh, let's make it even. Square plus one square. This is a number which is a sum of two squares. And so it must have a factorization in terms of, well, there's no twos. Uh, None of the primes in here are, are the primes one mod four that, are, that occur. So it must only be, if this is the full list, if this is the full list, uh, so if this is the full list, the only primes that are left are squares. So then this has to be a perfect square. This is some M squared because it's only a product of primes that are three mod four. But it's easy to see that, uh, okay, so if we call this big number P, so now we have the equation p squared minus p squared minus m squared equals one in the integers, which factors as p minus m times p plus m. And the only way integers multiply to one is if they're both one or both minus one. In either case, m has to be zero and, and you get a contradiction. Uh, p M squared minus P squared is one. Yes. Thanks. Hey. Not, that it matters. Not that it matters, right. So the point is, hey guys, the point is that uh, there were other ways to prove primes in certain progressions. So the power of Dirichlet's method is not that it gets some uh, particular cases, it's that it gets all the cases at once. Okay. Um, by quadratic reciprocity, th there was this whole long game. I mean, you, you, uh, people are going back and forth. Euler proved a whole bunch of cases. Uh, Legendre proved a whole bunch of cases. Then Gauss, armed with quadratic reciprocity, proved a whole bunch of cases. So, so lots of special cases known. Lots of special cases known. Euler, Lagrange, 
Legendre. Oh, this stuff is vaguely coming up in the uh, algebraic uh, number theory reading seminar. Uh -huh. I had a question like, why are we looking at things mod something? Right? Uh -huh. Like, why are we looking at trying to mod something? Feel like this had a lot to do with them. Yeah, yeah. So it was definitely a big open problem uh, that people were very much concerned with, and it's not until Dirichlet that they had a complete solution. So Dirichlet gives a complete solution. Now, you know, I always uh, gives complete solution gives complete solution. So it was a really big deal. I mean, he gets the Gauss chair uh, for this, or maybe he already had it. Let's see. Um, I think you can get primes one mod Q without characters, exactly, by looking at some cyclotomic fields, which is what Euler did. So Euler already knew, for example, anything that's one mod a prime. He, he could give proofs using cyclotomic polynomials uh, for this general case. But if you want primes that are 37 mod 61, <laughs> you know, good luck. Good luck finding a particular proof. Yes, exactly. Okay, let's see. Let me keep this here so I can see that there are more chats coming in. Can I hide this back there? Okay, good. So Dirichlet gives a complete solution following, of course, the, the brilliance of this is not just the, the, that he solves the problem, it's how he solves the problem, right? Uh, following uh, Euler plus lots of new ideas, new ideas. So I always like to imagine, you know, when, uh, whenever I, talk to any of my students. I say, these Euler, Dirichlet, what the hell do these guys know? They're all idiots. Figure it out yourself. How would you do it? So how would I do it? And then you realize that, no, no, you're the idiot. And they were brilliant. But then you, <laughs> then you appreciate, instead of just, uh, here's the proof and here's uh, you know, our modern understanding of it. No, like, how would you come up with this yourself? So, okay, you know, Euler, you know, the, the idea is clear. Uh, we're gonna try to show that the sum over the primes congruent to A mod Q, uh, one over p uh, diverges, right? This thing goes to goes to infinity. Okay, so how do you capture? And of course, this is the sum over all primes, one over p, and then the indicator function that p is congruent to a mod q. Maybe the first way you would think to do this is by is Dirichlet characters don't exist yet, so maybe you would think to do this using just you know finite. They understood uh, all kinds of things about uh, finite you know roots of unity. So, so you could uh, this indicator function is is equal to a sum over let's call this b mod q e to the two pi i over q um, b times p minus a, I guess with a factor of one over q. Yeah, Gauss well, this this is an additive uh, character, so it's not even a Gauss sum. I mean, this is just saying, and and by the way, so e of e of m. Of our x or whatever is always e to the two pi i x, and e sub q of x is always e to the two pi i x over q. And I especially use this when I'm thinking of x as a number mod q. So this will exactly, uh, this is just a geometric series. And uh, if p minus a is zero mod q, then this is all ones and you get Q ones, so, so you just get the indicator function. If it's not zero, then you're adding up points around the circle, which all cancel. Okay, maybe I should make that an exercise. If you don't already know it, let's make this an exercise. Okay, so, so you have this orthogonality of additive characters. So this is orthogonality, orthogonality of additive characters. Henrik has a nice story about doing just that. Before he was introduced to his advisor, he was trying to prove Dirichlet's theorem via a sieve. He said he thought he proved it, told a friend who said, yeah, you use characters. <laughs> so the friend said, oh yeah, you use characters. So- And, and Henrik had never heard of Dirichlet characters. Uh-huh, uh-huh, I at see. That, at that point, you know, very early on. I see. Yeah, well, neither had Dirichlet at this time. Right? <laughs> no one had invented them. Legendre had uh, the Legendre symbol, which was which is the first uh, character. But that's a real character. No one had thought to do, you know, complex analysis was still kind of in its infancy. So to use the, even Dirichlet's L functions, the input S is real. 
the character, the value of this that it takes can be complex, but the but the argument is real. It's not until uh, Riemann that we really see uh, see that. And then Henrik found a mistake in his proof. That's that's funny. No, I didn't know. I didn't know that story. Um, right. So so you could try to do something like this, and then the natural object, maybe the natural object, natural. It's the wrong object, but the natural object, if this is your idea, would be uh, something like a sum over n, one over n to the s, e to the two pi i, uh, you know, b times n. Maybe this is the thing that you would like to take. And this is somehow, it's not a, well, it's not an L function, but the, but it's, a, it's, it's called the, anybody know what this is called? I'm sure Lewis knows. Uh, it's like a lurch. Lurch, yeah. It's called the lurch data function, and it it like fails RH. There's all kinds of problems uh, with this thing. It's not something that we should. It's, it doesn't have um, an Euler product. There's, uh, it's it's a nice guess for for what you should do, but it's just the wrong it's just the wrong object. Why? Uh, when we take log, so it doesn't have an Euler product. First of all, it doesn't have an Euler product, so there's no way to take. Uh, uh, derivative or a logarithmic derivative, or just a, a log, and uh, and have sums over primes popping up. So he realizes he needs something that satisfies a different uh, property. So additive characters, additive characters are characters so that you know, like we like we have here, they're characters. Uh, well, if I call them just chi, it's characters so that chi of a plus b is you would think it's chi of a plus chi of b, but that would be a homomorphism into the additive real numbers, and characters should be homomorphisms into the multiplicative right. complex. Uh, exactly, like yeah. like an exponential. Exactly. So so and being an additive character means a plus b chi of a plus b is chi of a times chi of b, uh, whereas a multiplicative character, multiplicative character, is chi of a times b being chi of a times chi of b. How are you? Nice to see you. Yeah, long time. We should get we should get lunch sometime. We should get lunch sometime. Absolutely. Okay. Um, not today, but I'll email you. We'll find a we'll find a time. Yeah. Chi of a times chi of b. Okay, so that's sorry. Oh, George said, said lurch. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, so the so he realizes that the right object is not to study z mod q, which is where we have additive characters. The right object is to study is the multiplicative group z mod q cross. Now, thankfully, at least for for well, the notion of a group, in some sense, is already in Gauss's Discussiones Arithmeticae. Uh, but Gauss already understood. So for four, for Q a prime, Gauss already knew that this group knew that this, he wouldn't have used the word group, but he understood the concept. This group uh, is, anybody know what the group structure is for a prime? Which one? Of, of this. It's cyclic, right? It's cyclic. This one's obviously cyclic. You take one <laughs> and you add it. But Gauss yeah. understood that this group is actually cyclic, i.e., sorry, order, order, order yeah. Uh, I guess I'm trying to use Q for the modulus and P for a generic prime that will have that. Yeah. So forgive me for using Q for prime. It's a little bit uh, feels wrong to do that. Um, Gauss knew that this group is cyclic. That is, that is, uh, there always exists a primitive root, a generator. Exactly, primitive root. Same thing as a generator. So that's a number r such that the powers of r, r, r squared, r cubed, and so on, up to r to the q minus one, which Fermat knows is equal to one. You can prove this is something like Lagrange's theorem on polynomials or whatever, right? Like you get too many roots for a polynomial. Exactly. Exactly. You count. You count how many numbers have a given order. You can you do that for, for every 
a possible divisor of q minus one, and you just see lots of them have order q minus one. So there's lots of uh, primitive roots. So this will fill out all of uh, z mod q star. Okay. Uh, so. And also you get all the quadratic reciprocity stuff also. Right, right. Now you don't need a generator to, uh, to do things, but that's how, uh, that's how Dirichlet started out is by thinking about uh, these generators. But um, okay, so, so whatever the group structure is, this is, this is a group and so a uh, Dirichlet character. So, so here's the funny thing. Uh, it's not really yet a Dirichlet character, but just a group character, just a, a representation. You know, if we, if we look at uh, the unitary dual, so if we call this group G. So, so the unitary dual, I'm using fancy words to, to speak of very simple things, just to plant those words in your, in your head. Uh, the unitary dual is just the uh, set of unitary uh, irreducible representations, unitary irreducible representations up to equivalence. Never mind what that is. In, in this case, uh, it's, it's very simple. The, the, our group is, is abelian. This group is abelian. It was abelian before it was uh, cyclic, even if Q is not a prime and it's not a cyclic group. This uh, multiplication still commutes, so this is still an abelian group. So this will be uh, one dimensional. If this is if G is abelian, then this is all characters. So one dimensional representations, which is characters. So characters, a ca characters, a character. So chi is a map from the group is a homomorphism from. Uh, homomorphism from your group to C star, okay? So because, uh, because in the case of a prime, the group, the multiplicative group is cyclic, all you need to know is where the root goes, where the generator goes, and then you know the value of everything by the homomorphism property. Um, for Q prime need only determine the value of chi of, of a root, and then everything else, all else is determined. All else. Exactly. Exactly. So just let's do a, a quick example. You guys have a, a prime you like? Seven's good? Seven's good. Okay. So Q equals seven. Sorry? 57. 57, yes. Yeah, the growth and prime is a good one too. Uh, we would quickly discover by this pro process that it's not prime because we would be we would suffer and not find a primitive root. I think three, I think two is not. Uh, two, R equals two is uh, not a root, not a root because two cubed is already one. Two cubed is eight, not Q. But three, I think, is a root. So let's see. Is three is r equals three a root? So we have three. Three squared is two. Uh, two times three is six, which is negative one. So that's good. We're halfway. We should be hitting negative one when we're halfway. Yeah. And then negative one times three is negative three. Yeah, at this point, you're guaranteed, right? I'm guaranteed. Yeah, just, just yep, because that's the only possible uh, other orders. And uh, Let's see, this is negative three. This will be negative two, five. Uh, did I do that right? Four times three is 12, which is five. Five is negative two times three is negative six, uh, also known as one. And there's our, there's our six elements. So this is three cubed and three to the fourth and three to the fifth. And of course, three to the sixth, by Fermat. One hundred one is your favorite prime math 101 yeah well this will take a little long to uh, to write out if we do it for that for for that what is it there, there are like some specific statistical things people do like what is it probably that either two three or five is a yeah, exactly generator yeah very so large, right? okay so let me give you an exercise exercise uh r equals two is a root for infinitely many primes <laughs> And let me put several stars on this exercise. It's a major open problem. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, and so what are the characters? Well, 
what are the possible values? So if we have, um, we know that uh, R raised to the Q minus one is one, and chi is supposed to be a homomorphism. So this will be chi of R to the Q minus one, which is one. So we always have the Q minus one roots of unity. So in our case, we need values in the six roots of unity. So one, this number, this number, this number, this number, this number. So this is zeta equal to, what is it? A half plus root three i over two, the sixth root of unity. Yeah, that or, or it's conjugate or it's, uh, right, it's right. square and so on. So, um, so there are gonna be six possible values for R and hence six possible characters. So there's chi zero, chi one, chi two, chi three, chi four, and chi five. That's six characters. And then all I have to tell you is where does uh, so this last row is one. Its value on one is always one. All I have to tell you is where does it take three? So does it take three to one? Then it's the trivial character, and it takes everybody to one. Does it take three to zeta? Well, then it takes two to zeta squared and zeta cubed and zeta to the fourth and zeta to the fifth. Zeta cubed is also known as negative one. Or does it take uh, chi two to zeta squared, in which case this is zeta to the fourth. Zeta to the fourth squared is zeta to the eighth. Um, So I jump by twos, jump by two, jump by two, jump by two. So this is one. Right. Zeta, zeta, uh, sorry, I multiply by zeta squared every time. I don't square it. I multiply by zeta squared. So that's zeta to the six, yeah. and then uh, and then I'm and then it, it just repeats zeta squared, zeta to the four. And then how about chi three? Uh, chi three will be zeta cubed. Zeta cubed is negative one. So this is negative one, one, negative one, one, negative one. So this is a uh, Legendre symbol. The real Legendre, this is the real character, Legendre symbol uh, dot over seven. So this is tells you whether or not the number is a square mod seven. This is uh, uh, well, zero if n is, uh, let's make this n, is divisible by seven, if seven divides n. Or if uh, n is a square mod seven, then you get one. And if n is not a square, uh, then you get negative one. Okay, so for example, how come two is a square mod seven? Well, it's right here, nine, three squared. And how about, well, four is obviously a square. None, none of six or three or five are squares. So the only squares mod seven are one, two, and four. Okay. Uh, and then, okay, so you fill out this table. There's, there's kind of not that much to it. Um, okay, so the brilliant idea, now you've discovered the group characters and there, and so, you know, some, uh, simple exercises, exercises, uh, let's make this a little bigger. Let's have a couple of exercises. Uh, one is orthogonality. If you sum over all of the characters mod Q, so you sum over all the characters mod Q, chi of any number, and you divide by how many there are. So how many are there? It's P of Q. So uh, I guess I should have said the structure of the group. So the structure of this group is exactly the structure of Z mod Q cross itself. And so the cardinality, the size of Z mod Q cross, this is the euler toshi function. Full generality. In full generality, yes. I'm, I'm only doing it for primes, but I'm writing things that are true in, in full generality. Uh, if you sum over uh, chi of A, so you fix a number like two and you sum down two, well, you get these different roots and they all cancel, zero, uh, unless, you, unless A is equal to one, in which case you get six ones and you're dividing by six, you get one. If A is one, uh, if, uh, if A is one, 
Okay. I've had lots of years of Blackboard management practice, <laughs> not as many in practice on this thing. So uh, this is one exercise and another exercise. So this is uh, when you sum over the characters. Another one is if you fix the character and you sum over the elements, A mod Q. Um, well, I'll put the prime there, but in a second, we'll, we'll take the prime away, one over P of Q. This will also, so if you, sum up, if you fix a character and you sum all of the uh, values of that character, again, it's completely balanced and they, they exactly cancel out unless it's the trivial character. So if it's the trivial character, chi is chi is zero and zero otherwise. So you have these two um, orthogonalities for multiplicative characters. So prime means that uh, so sum sum a over q prime means by definition by definition is a sum over a mod q with a and q full prime. Now what I'm about to remove this prime Dirichlet's brilliant idea. What makes this a Dirichlet character, not just a group character? Is to extend this to a function on uh, is to it's sort of playing the additive group against the multiplicative group. So extend extend chi to a function on all of the naturals or even uh, in a minute all the integers, in a minute all the reals uh, to see by chi of n equals zero if n and q have a factor in common. So this, I don't know, is this obvious to you guys? I don't know that this is the, I guess it's, I don't know, hindsight is so powerful. Uh, I don't know that I would have come up with this immediately. I don't know how long it took me to come up with it. You mean like even knowing the Lagrange characters are zero divisible values? Yeah, I guess that's a good hint. That's probably a good hint. Now, why do you choose it that way now? So I guess. Yeah, for the multiplicative properties, right? So. A for the multiplicative properties. Yep, to be to be uh, totally multiplicative. B to be uh, to actually count the number of points on things. Like the Legendre symbol is very good at counting how many solutions are there to n squared plus one, right. for example. Uh, and George says, the more you've learned, the more it's less obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I really don't know why this is the thing that you should do, but it obviously is. Um, how, did I, how did I get this over? Yeah, it's what works. <laughs> it is definitely what works. I can't seem to pull this, okay, whatever. Uh, what else is George saying? Because in ideals, it's so confusing. Uh, you, what do you mean? Like you, they, they do the same thing in, um algebraic number fields without with ideals uh -huh. and like it's kind of confusing how it's supposed to work out in that situation actually and and then i looked back at, at this situation i'm like wait that's actually kind of not obvious either yeah in a way i agree i agree i think i, I don't know that there's a book that, that explains why this has to be the thing that every book says this is what you do and here the theorem all works out but why why this? I guess you could try all kinds of other stuff and just see that nothing else works. Um, but I don't have I don't like this or... additive multiplicative thing happening, I guess. Exactly. You're playing the additive multiplicative against each other. It kind of seems to me like you take uh, Z and then you take it mod Q. Um, so you end up wrapping it around. And then this is just like you take three images. You take it the, the value of the character and kind of take a pre image under that map. I agree. Assign the value of the pre images of the value of the character. It doesn't seem that unnatural. No, it's, it's very natural to extend it to numbers that are co prime to Q, where you have values. And on the other values, you just put zero. Yeah, okay. So my question is why? Yeah. Okay. How would you know to put zero and not? Right. Multiplicative character, that's a lot bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 But it's definitely, obviously, the right thing to do. Uh, yeah, and the fact that the multiplicative group sits inside the additive group is kind of special from a group theory point of view, right? Right. It's really, you know, uh, it's really the ring structure. It's really the ring structure of Z mod Q that it has this multiplicative group inside 
that, uh, you know, like George said, this is something you can do for any, uh, if you have rings and ideals sitting inside them. Anyway, so this, this is, this is what he does. Intuition by process of elimination. <laughs> I agree. Um, was there another comment? Yeah. Yeah, so it's not group theory, it's ring theory. This is really a, a special thing about rings. This is a ring property, not a group. Not, not group. Rings are weird. <laughs> I mean, rings, some of our, some of our best friends are rings, right? Yeah, yeah. Z sure. and so on. Okay, um, so once you do that, then you say, okay, so let's go back to what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to, we're trying to sum over the primes with this indicator function that P is congruent to A mod Q. And now you can use orthogonality of multiplicative characters instead of orthogonality of additive characters. If we sum over all these characters, so of course A has to be co-prime to Q for, uh, for there to be primes. We, we only wanna do this if A and Q are co-prime, in which case there's a multiplicative inverse. So this uh, Dirichlet reasons, I imagine, I'm sort of trying to peek into his head. And this is why I wanna separate primes and and this prime Q modulus, although Q doesn't have to be prime uh, soon. So then we can sum over all characters mod Q, one over the number of them. And then how do we capture that P, well, this is the same thing as A bar times P is one mod Q, where A bar, A, A bar is one mod Q. A bar is the multiplicative inverse mod Q. So, uh, so we can put here chi of A bar P. This sum over the characters will pick off whether A bar P is one or not. But by the multiplicativity, so again, you have two sums, we, you should get them in the, in the other order, and this decomposes as chi A bar chi of P. And so now you have a sum one over P of Q, a sum over chi mod Q, chi of A bar times, a sum over the primes, chi of p over p. So if this is the kind of thing you want to work with, and if you want to mimic uh, Euclid, if you remember, this was just the leading term in a, in a big expansion when we took log of, of the zeta function. So mi to, mimic, to mimic Euclid, the natural object now, natural to study, natural to study. This I do think is natural. The limit as S goes to one from the right. Remember S is uh, still a real, a real variable here of, of the following, of the following expression, one over phi of Q, a finite sum over the characters mod Q, chi of A bar, which he actually wrote this explicitly in terms of uh, the roots of unity, where all the different characters are mod, mod these roots. And then a sum over all primes, chi of p over p to the s, plus chi of p squared, which is just chi of p squared, over 2 p to the 2s, plus chi of p cubed over 3 p to the 3s, and so on. So all of these objects he knows are going to, nothing's going to happen to this. This is big O of 1 as s goes to 1. Why do you want to add all of these on? Well, so, so this is, uh, uh, again, it, um, negative log of one minus X. This is our, our favorite series of all time, which was also Euler's uh, sort of starting process. So we're going to take X now to B, and this is where it's important that this is a multiplicative character, that that two comes outside and that three comes outside and so on. So we're going to take X to be chi of P over P to the S. And it's the multiplicative structure here that allows you to do this kind of thing. Now, this is where a lot of books, and I learned this from Eli Stein. So Stein has a, has a treatment of this where he's very careful about um, defining the complex logarithm in a way that you, because what we're trying to do is convert a product into sums. And so caveat, lots of books struggle at this point, including Davenport. So Davenport, I looked back at Davenport last night 
and he says, well, yeah, there's an issue with this you know, logarithm is a multi-value function. We want to take the value that makes everything kind of work out. And you can see in the limit that this thing converges, uh, that the L function converges uh, to one as S goes to infinity. So uh, we want the log you know, to go to zero and not to two pi i or something. And that's the branch cut that we want to take. And in that branch, I mean, it's, it's a very complicated argument. So uh, need to worry, need to worry about branch cuts with the complex logarithm and branch cuts. I don't like worrying. I will work very hard to uh, be very lazy. So, uh, so I like a different way of doing this. I, I like to define define a function little l chi of s to be exactly this this kind of sum: a sum over primes, a sum over k uh, chi of p to the k over k p to the ks. There's no problem defining this series. The series converges perfectly well if the real part of S or if S itself is greater than one. If you like, you can put real part here. There's no problem with this convergence. And then observe, so observe or fact, observe that the exponential of this function L of chi S is exactly equal to a sum over the, over the integers chi of n over n to the s. There's no problem with the exponential function. There's a problem with the logarithm function, but not exponential. So why is this true? Well, what is the exponential function, right? Uh, what, what does this mean? It means one, exactly. Well, yes, and it turns sums into products. Uh, formal power series, uh, well, yeah, the exponential function is defined by its, by its power series, yes. Uh, so this will be L chi of S squared over two factorial plus L chi of S cubed over three factorial and so on. And so why does this come out to this nice thing? Well, if you take what the sum is and you try to work out what the S, the nth uh, term is, uh, you're going to find some, some difficult combinatorics. So, so let's just try this. Uh, this is, uh, we, we talked about this some time ago, right, guys? Yeah, yeah. So, so we, we summed over the primes um, and, uh, and we got, uh, you know, chi of P over P to the S plus chi of P squared over P to the 2S and so on. So that's, that's, that's just L of S itself opening up plus this thing squared. So now we're going to pick up numbers that are products of two primes. Uh, p to the 2s, I'm missing a 2 here, over 2 p to the 2s, and so on, squared, and then products of three primes, and so on. Well, okay, every number is a product of some number of primes in some number of ways, but you'll get these, uh, these funny coefficients coming up. So, for example, uh, the primes, okay, we're going to get chi of p over p to the s, exactly from here. Here's the number 1. The number 1 is here. The prime p to the s is here. How about products of two primes? Well, products of two primes could either be p squareds, or how about squares of a prime? Well, you get a one half from here. You also get a factor of, uh, when you square this out, uh, sorry, I'm missing a one half. Okay, so, so, the re so, so we get one plus a sum over all primes of chi of p over p to the s plus a sum over all primes of chi of p squared over p to the s, which comes with a factor of one half from this term and another factor of one half from that term. And then numbers that are products of two primes, which will come from uh, multiplying these kinds of things out and collecting terms. And now why does all of this term collection come out to the constant one every single time. And that's because, so uh, there's a combinatorial problem, combinatorial problem. Why do all such coefficients uh, come out exactly equal to one? 
And it's the same reason that if you take the exponent of the series itself, x plus, of, this is just being obfuscated by the fact that there's primes and characters here. If you take this, uh, whoops, no factor up here. If you take this series and exponentiate it, you're dealing with the same combinatorics. It reduces that. Exactly. Has exactly the same combinatorial problem. Combinatorial problem. But you know what this is, because this is, at least in some range, this is e of minus log of 1 minus x, just over the reals. And so over the reals, you know this is going to come out to 1 over 1 minus x. And so this sum of per, per prime, so for each prime, so prime by prime, prime by prime, we have x of L chi s is equal to what used to be a sum over all primes becomes a product over all primes. And what used to be term by term, uh, things like this with, with x equal to uh, chi of, with x equal to chi of p over p to the s, term by term, you get one over one minus uh, chi of p over p to the s. So there's like a some combinatorial argument for why these coefficients have to correspond. Exactly, but I don't even have to do the combinatorics. Right. Because it comes out in this setting, it's the same combinatorics as this setting. Okay, so whatever the combinatorial identity is that allows this uh, to be true, it's the same combinatorial. So I can prove all of those combinatorial identities at once by just appealing to it in this special case. Okay. And, and now you can now you can now that you have this series now you multiply all of this out and you get exactly by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic again chi of n over n to the s. Okay. And this is the special case of where right the both series converge in the correct sort of spots, right? So it's like the conversion from series to explicit formula makes sense. Right, this is all in the range of absolute convergence. Right. We were able to re, re, uh, reorder the terms any which way we like. Yeah, what I, what I mean is that, right, this log uh, one minus X, I mean, the one over one minus X. Uh -huh. so like series expansion. Yes. Works for absolute value. Exactly. Right, less than one, and then for the other side, right for the um, our complicated side or whatever. Yeah, this also converges when the absolute We're value is less. Fine, right? so, yep. Yep. No, Everything's absolutely convergent. Uh, there's no problem. So in this definition of exponential, of course, we have to re we have to reorder all the terms. Uh, so the point is, uh, you can do all of that in this in this region of absolute convergence. This actually works. Okay, so instead of doing it with some kind of, you know, either wishy-washy or some very complicated thing where you keep track of branch cuts, just the natural object is the is this L. Right. Its exponent is, of course, the even more natural object. This is the, this is now finally Dirichlet's L function. This is a Dirichlet. It's like the the bijection is the existence of the bijection is sufficient. Right? Well, I'm only going in one direction. I'm right, only right. going from from little L to capital L. Right, and that's like yeah. And that's it. And that's enough. Why is it enough? Okay, so let's see why. Uh, so now it suffices. Okay, so we need some facts about about these L functions. Uh, need facts, which we will prove in just a minute. But let's use the facts to to finish the argument. Uh, need certain facts about the L functions. So one is that they're in, uh, have have meromorphic continuation. In fact, have analytic continuation analytic continuation to entire functions. The same process that we did. The same process. We'll, we'll review it because it's slightly, there's some subtleties that, that come up. Yeah, this is assuming that chi is not the trivial character. We didn't talk about primitive and imprimitive yet. That, that'll come up. And uh, and one extra in ingredient. Well, primitive uh, is, I mean, the, uh, what you said, the uh, high zero. That is a zeta function. Exactly. Exactly. Chi zero will be all ones except for uh, 
it accepted zero on that one prime. Right. So since so it has modified zeta function. It's zeta with one prime factor removed. Exactly. And these can be grouped up like in uh I've seen somewhere they, they call this like a oh generalized zeta and then they have like another parameter. Um uh, apostle talks about uh, uh -huh. Where you where you remove some some finite number of prime factors yeah, from there. Regardless like, if you remove them, there's like one general way to treat them that's not like a, uh -huh. that's all sort of like the zeta function with an extra prime. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Well, so uh, let's just make that explicit. Uh, if if chi is the trivial character, then L of chi zero s is just a product over the primes. That are co-prime to Q exactly, exactly. of uh, the usual. Right, because it's pretty much what he does. You're just missing a couple factors. Right? Exactly. Like the, uh, yeah, yeah, which, yeah. which is nothing but zeta times the product over all primes dividing Q. If you put these factors back in, zeta has them all with a, with an inverse. So just multiply in the ones that divide Q. Right. This, yeah, is, a, this is a finite this product. Is what I was about. Yeah. So this is how you remove primes from the from the other product of zeta. So in a sense, they're almost that should the be an function, S. Right? Exactly. Well, certainly their analytic behavior is the same. In particular, uh, if this thing goes to infinity as S goes to one. So this not only goes to infinity, this has a simple pull. This is important. Simple pull. And this is entire. Right. I mean, uh, yeah, it's completely an entire function. Okay, this is a finite product. This finally many primes dividing. Okay, um, so we need these facts, and so now let's go back to Dirichlet's argument, which is, can we show that this thing diverges? So let me rewrite that. So to prove Dirichlet, to prove Dirichlet, can we show? That uh, so we have one over phi of q, sum over the characters mod q, uh, chi of a bar. That's the number that we want to show that there are primes congruent mod q um, of l chi of s. Can we show that this sum, which again is to first order a sum over primes congruent a mod q, uh, one over p to the s plus big O of one? Can we show that this diverges? If we can show that this diverges, then we've shown that this diverges. This is, of course, as S goes to one. Yeah, we do this with all the equalities and stuff that we've done at top. Yeah, so, so, so this identity, sorry, I can't point to the screen for the Zoom people. Uh, <laughs> this identity is just this first term, and then there's the prime powers. Exactly. exactly. And the first term, when we, when we use the uh, orthogonality relation on the characters, let's make sure the Qs don't look like A's. Uh, then all the, the only primes that remain, it becomes the indicator function that the primes are a mod q. Right, right, right. As, right. And what you're saying about the big O, the, the S goes to one, that part doesn't matter. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. This part is bounded, remains bounded any, any which way you, right. uh, you handle things. This remains bounded as S goes to one. Right. Exclusively. Yeah. Now, Okay, so this is going to get a little bit. Uh, let's be careful here, because there are a lot of people that uh, there are a lot of treatments that that I don't let that I don't like. Um, this expression is this expression real valued when s is real valued? Because anytime you have a complex character. It's conjugate, it's also a character. Okay, so this is R valued, R valued for real S. The only issue could potentially come at like the halfway point, but those are real. Exactly, exactly. We can have real characters. This is because complex characters, if C takes values in complex. Right, its inverse is it, different and is also. Exactly. Yeah. And it's conjugate. Yeah, 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 it's conjugate. Yeah. 
because uh, if C is a complex character, that means it doesn't only take real values, it's a complex character, then so is chi bar. Okay. This is real valued for real S. Uh, one of the characters, one contribution is chi equal to chi zero. And we know that L chi zero of S goes to infinity and comes with a factor of one in front. Chi zero of A bar, which is equal to one, blows up as S goes to one. So the only way this doesn't blow up is if there's a factor that's going to minus infinity. So if, if other, uh, if there exists other factors, so uh, if no other factor, let's put it this way, if no other factor go, goes to minus infinity, then we have our desired blow. Then uh, the star, the star. Are you looking at these like pairing them up? So you don't have to think about other directions. Well, there's going to be two potential directions. Exactly. There's going to be two potential directions. If no other factor goes to infinity, then um, then uh, then star diverges. Now, what are the factors? The factors look like this. The factors look like chi of A, L chi of S, plus chi bar of A, L chi bar of S. Yes, thanks. Uh, yes. I mean, I put the bar, the bar, it's the same thing. Yeah. But just to make it look exactly like it is on top. So this combination of things, this is twice the real part of uh, chi A bar L chi of S. Right? This is the complex conjugate of this. And so the real part could be positive or negative. I mean, the, this chi of A bar could be pointing you in some direction, right? I don't know where, if this is gonna blow up, I don't know where it's gonna blow up. So you are taking S real? We're taking S real, but chi could, chi could be complex. Right, right, right. So, so the, the conjugate, what I mean is the conjugate for S doesn't matter, right? Because you're taking S to zero. Maybe. That's right, that's right. Right, okay, you, so. Yeah. Uh, S is real. S is real. Right. Yeah. We're just taking the limit down. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, what I want to say is uh, the only thing that can happen for L chi. Um, uh, how do I want to say this? This thing can. This is a real number. So if it's blowing up, there's only two ways to blow up as real numbers. You can blow up to plus infinity or blow up to minus infinity. Uh, this can go to plus infinity or it can go to minus infinity. If it goes to plus infinity, there's no, there's no concern. The concern is if it goes to minus infinity, it starts canceling off uh, this uh, trivial character that's blowing up and giving us our divergence. Who wins? Uh, Who wins, exactly, exactly. So um, how could this go to, uh, so plus infinity we're not concerned about, but plus infinity uh, could be bad if this chi, in other words, what am I trying to say? I want to say that uh, we should be we should only be concerned. Need to. Well, the only possibility, only possibility, for going to infinity, is that uh, L of chi s uh, goes to. Um, this is complex valued. You have to be a little careful here. Uh, is that the real part, the real part of L of chi S goes to minus infinity. I claim that the real part of L of chi S cannot go to plus infinity. So claim we can't have, can't Wait, have- You're saying only possibility of what? Of divergence, of divergence. The truth will be that none of these diverge, right. but we were trying to rule that out. Uh, the, the only possibility of divergence of such a, of such a, a series 
is if the real part goes to minus infinity, not to plus infinity. Is it a complex question of um, we, we'll see in a second uh, what happens to the, to the complex parts. We can't have this going to plus infinity. Why not? Otherwise, it's exponent. The exponential, the absolute value of the exponential of something is equal to e to the real part. But this, we already saw, is the L function. And these things are entire. In particular, they're regular at one. This is bounded as S goes to one. This is regular, no pole, regular. I have to, I have to prove that for you. Yep, at S equals one. So the real part must also be bounded. Why. From above, it might not be bounded from below. Right, because that would help the fact that it's yes. negative. So only issue, only issue is if the real part um, of Ls pi goes to minus infinity. Why don't I care about the imaginary part blowing up? Why is that not a concern? Because they cancel. Right. For all I care, so this is important. For all I care, for these parents, for these, we, yeah, for for the for the purposes of this theorem, uh, we could have could have uh, the imaginary parts blowing up, L chi, uh, imaginary parts of L chi s going to infinity. So, so this is, part, what's the imaginary part? Well, secretly, this is the logarithm. And it's the imaginary parts of the logarithm that aren't well-defined, so I don't care. I don't care about branch cuts and I don't care about, uh, about, about this uh, imaginary part. All I care about is the, is the real part. Now, if this happens, if the real part is going to minus infinity, then, that just happened. then if this happens, if this, then again, the exponential is the L function. Then L of chi s goes to zero right. as s goes to one. Because the, the real part, x e to the minus infinity is zero. Right, that controls the magnitude. So the magnitude goes to zero. Exactly. The exactly. So, so we're going to reverse all of this logic and say if the L functions. Uh, therefore, 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 it suffices to show, suffices to show that for all characters that are not the trivial character, L of S chi does not go to zero, is not zero. Right, and this also applies to the real ones because the real ones have no complex part, right? And there's a... That's going to be the tricky thing. The real ones will be the tricky thing. The complex ones right. we're about to get rid of right away. Right, yeah, yeah, that's right. But my point in this treatment, I, again, I think this is a slightly different treatment than, than what I've seen in other texts. And I'd be happy to be proved wrong if someone can, can find this. But it's that we can be working entirely within these little L's and taking exponentials and not dealing with anything with, uh, uh, with it's not sketchy. You can, you can do it. Stein did it perfectly rigorously, but it takes work. And I'd rather, uh, I'm lazy. I'd rather not do that. Work. And the work it takes isn't the essence of the proof. It's it's not yeah, it's not the essence of the proof. Although you know, what's the essence of a proof? Right? If any part of it is is uh, shaky, then you don't have a proof, right? No, a real proof. Okay. Wait, are you saying because supposedly Dirichlet did it without any complex numbers or like complex no. analysis, complex functions? He, he did it without complex analysis, without complex uh, valued functions, but the uh, in other words, the inputs. So this, this S was real. L chi, chi is complex. So he's dealing uh -huh. with complex functions that take complex values, but only uh, real inputs. Right. And so we should do it like he did. Well, we could, so I'm gonna cheat and now use uh, what we know about complex uh, analytic functions because I wanna play uh, 
let's get rid of the fact that so it's easy to show easy to show that if chi is complex that is not a real character then l chi s does not vanish this is going to be easy to show what will be much more difficult and riemann understood this already is that the real characters this legendre symbol the legendre symbol will come back to bite us and for that one we have to prove this non-vanishing in a much more involved way which i think i'd like to do by taking a uh, a very scenic route in through uh, there's there are much more direct proofs of the class number formula and by the way you don't even need the class number formula to prove uh to prove this non-vanishing i mean yeah 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 yeah, I, I've seen that. in Stein's uh, book, Stein Shikarchi, they give a, a proof that, that does not evaluate the L function, but it's so much better if you actually can evaluate, you get all these uh, amazing uh, uh, facts. So, um, George, did I answer your, your question? You were saying he's not thinking about it as uh, in terms of complex analysis, but I do want to think about it now for a second in terms of complex analysis. So in order to take a shortcut, you use like integer order of like pulse have to be integer order. Bingo. Bingo. Exactly. That's exactly what I want to use. So uh, so again, I owe you the fact that these things have analytic continuation will uh, looks like we're going to do that next time. Um, if uh, L chi S is zero, then L chi uh, S is well is S times something entire, uh, S minus one times some, some entire function. Right. Um, and, uh, and similarly, uh, L chi bar of S is also S minus one times some, some other entire function. And if we look at, so now this little trick, here's a little trick. Uh, trick set a equal to one. When we set a equal to one, then this a of uh, one over phi of q somewhere over the characters mod q, chi of a bar is now one. And then all of these l, l chi's, l chi of s's. So this thing, uh, in fact, forget about this one over phi of q. Also, that's just a constant that doesn't do anything for us. When I exponentiate this, when I exponentiate this, I get exactly a product over all of the characters, mod Q, of the L functions. On the other hand, what is this? Well, it's a, when, when you open up these characters, it's a sum over the primes that are congruent to one mod Q of one over P to the S plus one over uh, two p to the two s plus and so on, right? All of the all of the uh, additive stuff has been um, uh, all of the characters have been removed. It's just totally real valued things, okay? And whatever this is, it, maybe there aren't any primes, but whatever this is, this is non-negative. It's real and non-negative. And so the exponent is at least one. One of these characters is zeta. One chi is chi zero. And, and for that character, so, so we have the contribution from chi zero. In the one, in the equals one case, you mean when they all end up being empty? Um, what I mean is in this, in this product, one of the terms in the product is the trivial character. Oh. Okay. So uh, one of the terms in the product is the trivial character. The trivial character blows up like this near one. One over chi of q. Oh, I just said forget about it for a second. Okay. Just, just forget about. I just want to uh, look at this expression. Okay. Okay. Set a equals one and set phi of q equals one. <laughs> get get rid of that. It's just a constant. It's not doing anything. I I don't need it in the. I don't want to write this thing raised to the phi of q or something. Because now I have to think about how you raise a complex function to a, a, a number. Even so if that, looking exclusively at this expression. I'm just looking at this expression. Yeah, just look at look at this thing. Look at this sum over all the characters and exponentiate. The sum, because the characters have all been uh, added out, all you're getting is sums over primes that are one mod q and 
the prime squares that are one my q and so on. Um, and whatever this is, it's a non-negative, uh, it's, it's just a bunch of positive, it might be an empty sum. We don't know that there's any primes that are one my q. Actually, we do because of Euler, but never mind. Uh, but it, whatever it is, it's it's not it's not negative. And so it's exponential is is positive, strictly positive, is one. It's at least one. Now, this is the chi zero contribution. And if what I was asking before, what if that sum is empty? Then you're saying that it's uh, if this value, whole sum is empty, value zero. Yeah. Is what you're saying? Yeah, the empty sum has value zero by default. And then we have our two characters, chi and chi bar, each of which contribute an s minus one times something and an s minus one times something else. What we said here is that if, if there's a vanishing, so if there exists a complex character, a complex character with L chi S vanishing, then he has a brother and both of them vanish. That's chi zero. This is chi zero. This is the two bad guys. And the two bad guys team up and beat up chi zero, and this thing goes to zero, which is, of course is a contradiction. I think in this complex analysis has an integer order of uh, decay. Exactly. Uh, That's why I want to use complex variables in a way that Dirichlet didn't have accessible to him, but he had other, uh, he, he basically understood this proof. Okay, so the only question is who doesn't have a brother? The real one. The real one, right. So only question that remains remains is does does um, L chi s equals zero for chi real. Okay. Any questions on on this argument, which I think is again, this is just like it's the same treatment. I'm not saying the same thing you here. But just the emphasis on not doing anything with complex log, but only using this exponentiation, which is an entire process. Everything else is just bounded. Okay. And I have and S then minus then one squared. Yep, these are all in, yeah. There's nothing hard. Okay. Great. Almost looks a little bit like the uh, prime number theorem kind of uh, oh multiplying factors for it to uh, yeah to yeah meet out holes and stuff like that. The non-vanishing of L functions. There are two million dollar problems that are about non-vanishing of L functions. Right. Two of the seven play problems are about when when can L functions vanish or not. There's the Riemann hypothesis and there's a Burgess window desire. Both of which are about when does this happen? This is zero. You guys, I'm sorry, at home can't see. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, um, good. What can I do in three minutes? Should I just let you go or should we? Um, I think we can do in, th I think in three minutes we can extend Kai. So, we're going to want to, I, I, I owe you two things. I owe you that L, the real character, doesn't vanish. So I owe you, I owe you. One is that the real character, Kai real, doesn't vanish. You're gonna take the scenic route for that. And I'll take the scenic route. Yeah, we'll take a little time class to develop this. Formula. Exactly, uh, class number formula, which means we need to understand what class numbers are and uh, do a little bit of Gauss. There's a lot of fun stuff in here. Do some Eisenstein series. Um, yep. <laughs> And, uh, and I owe you that all of these things have analytic continuation, have analytic continuation as entire functions, not just meromorphic. Uh, there's no poles right. as entire functions. We, first, we use that as part of the argument. This is first section of function three. Right? Yes, yes. Although again, I think I have a slightly different way right, that right. I like to- End explain. results. Yes, the end results are all, the end results, I mean, the end results, I'm not really gonna do anything yet. Maybe maybe we'll touch on a few more recent things, but um, yeah, maybe I shouldn't. You know, I'm going to start trying, and then I'm going to rush the presentation. We we can end a minute early, and uh, 
These are the two things that we'll, we'll, we'll pick up with this. We'll do this quickly next time and then start getting to work on this. Please. So how long did it take Dirichlet to do all of this? Like, is this something that he kind of thought about and then he worked on oh, it for a day, put, the, put it away for a year, come back and look at it more? It's such a good question. I have no idea. I have no idea. Bro, how long does it take for ideas like this to develop? It's it's such a good question. There's a lot happening here. It's like leaps and bounds. This is leaps and bounds. He develops Dirichlet characters. First of all, he develops group characters. Then he extends them to the naturals. Then he thinks to multiply them all together, and uh, you know, and have this uh, orthogonality condition pick off the primes that are a mod q for you. He first does it just for the primes. That was already hard enough, and then he and then he you know figures out what the general case looks like, and it looks exactly the same. Um, and then so. he still see that like L chi of s not equal to zero, and then he didn't have the complex case for three, so he must have done that in a different way. As well. he, so that's a great question. I think of him as doing it for free for other reasons, but I don't know what those other reasons are. I guess Kashi was already doing complex analysis in the 1910s, and this is the 1930s. So we're not at Riemann yet. So my 18, um, right? 18. sorry, not oh, 19. 19. Yes, 18, 18, 18 tens is Kashi starting to develop complex analysis, and we're in the 1830s. Um, I mean, I, I believe like the super elementary treatment. I don't know if uh, Dirichlet did anything like this, but I believe the super elementary treatment also gets rid of the complex case rather easily. Yes. So by the same process. The by the same kind of process, not appealing to complex analysis, but appealing to other like, kinds of estimates. Right, like doing big O's and yeah. like estimating with integrals and stuff like that. Yeah. Did Dirichlet possibly do something like that? Um, I am embarrassed to say I have not. You know, I always try to convince you guys that we should look at the primary sources and because they're really readable. They're there. Right, right. Uh, I have not uh, looked at Dirichlet's actual document, so I will fix that for next time. 